Salt Lake City, Utah, 1936. The United States is in the midst of the Great Depression. The country was hopelessly short on food, money, and candy. Menlo Fountain Smith, a young man no older than 10, worked with his four sisters at their father's soft drink company, the Cool Maid Company. You might be thinking Cool Maid might be related to Kool Aid, and you'd be somewhat correct. Cool Maid, much like Cool Aid, was a powdered sugary substance that came in a variety of flavors. As Cool Maid gained popularity, Cool Aid, which had been established just under a decade prior, didn't take too kindly to what they considered to be a blatant copycat. Cool Aid, Cool Aid. Be sure that the envelope says Cool Aid. And so they demanded the Smith family change the name of their Cool Maid under threat of legal action. The Smiths' operation was quite small. This wasn't a battle they had any chance of winning. So Menlo's father would rename Cool Maid to Frutola. Very shortly after, the Food and Drug Administration came forward saying they found the name Frutola to be misleading, considering the products contained no real fruit. So they would re-rename Frutola to the more ambiguous Frazola. Times were tough for the Smiths. Frazola was a refreshing delight during the summer, but sales would plummet in the winter. Nobody wanted to mix up a cold, fruity beverage in January, let alone the Great Depression. As if all this wasn't bad enough, World War II had just begun. Up until now, everything was working against the Smith family. But it was at this terrible moment in history that something unexpected occurred. Nearly all at once, the one-cent packages of Frazola were flying off of store shelves. Because sugar was suddenly in such short supply because of the war, candy companies rationed what little they had for their highest margin products. This made Frazola one of the only sugar-based products sold at just a penny. A salesman told Mr. Smith, you know what the children are doing? They are eating the powder straight. It was then that Mr. Smith had a realization, one that would turn the entire sweets industry on its head. Frazola didn't need to be dissolved into water or frozen into popsicles to make people buy it. It didn't even need to compete with Kool-Aid at all. All that Mr. Smith needed to do was market Frazola a little differently. Kid, what the hell are you eating? Is that laundry soap? It's ligamy. Want some? Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Gee, what a key movie. I love that Willy Wonka. Yeah, but how about that Chocolate Factory? A special offer from the Boston Quaker, a miniature candy factory. And they're made by Willie Walker. That's Walker, not Salka or Falka, but Walker. And that's me. Oh, hello. I'm Record. Whenever I discover something interesting that doesn't see much attention, I make a record of it. Then this record is transmogrified into an easily digestible visual medium. It's a process I like to call Microwave Rewind. Fast forward to 1970. The Quaker Oats Company had a killer plan. They would acquire the rights to Rolf Dahl's hugely popular children's novel, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, with plans to adapt it into a film. 
At the time, the idea of a serial company financing a film sounded more than a little strange, but this would turn out to be a genius concept from Quaker Oats. They were already looking to branch out into selling a new line of candy. What better way to market said candy than with a 90-minute commercial starring everyone's favorite candy man? At this time, Menlo Smith, now 43 years old and in charge of what was once his father's humble Frizzola factory, is now a sprawling candy conglomerate, the Sunmark Corporation. Quaker Oats brought their pitch to Menlo in hopes of striking a deal. They wanted one of Menlo's candy plants to create three new candy products to release in time for the film. These candies would be the Wonka Peanut Butter Scrunch Bar, Oompas, and the Scrum Diddly Umptious Bar. The plan was for Quaker Oats to have Paramount Pictures distribute the film. The first $2.9 million made from the movie would go to Quaker Oats to make back what they spent investing in the film and the candy production. The rest would be split 50-50 with Paramount. However, profit from the Wonka candy would all go to Quaker Oats, and by extension, the Sunmark Corporation. Menlo and his team were skeptical, but intrigued. Such an outrageous marketing strategy would be risky, but it might just be crazy enough to work. Sunmark was no stranger to experimental marketing. Their current family of products are marketed mostly to younger children. So just a couple years back, they tried to take on a more mature demographic. And not with their usual tart candy, but with their very first try at chocolate. The Christie Bar and the Cabaret Bar, developed by Sunmark's Concord plant. Not unexpectedly, Christie and Cabaret struggled to stand out among the cool kids of the time, and were quietly discontinued after less than five years. Menlo warned Quaker that the chocolate business wasn't an easy market to jump on, but Quaker insisted their plan was foolproof. Quaker intended on keeping the tie-in candy a secret until the film was to be released, as a means to hide the fact that it was all simply a glorified advertisement. All Sunmark had to do was have the production lines for the aforementioned candy up and running before the deadline. Quaker Oats would even offer to pitch in to speed up the engineering process. It was clear they were confident in Wonka. So Menlo agreed to the deal, and soon, for the first time ever, Willy Wonka's fictional confections would be available at your local supermarket. A year had passed. Sunmark produced all the candy that was requested of them right on time for the film. There are several conflicting sources about a more simply titled Wonka Bar, similar to those shown in the film, having been released at this time. The film's producer, David L. Wolper, even goes as far as to say, Wonka Bars had been shipped to stores, but were recalled because the chocolate would melt at room temperature. The picture comes out, and of course, Quaker Oats puts the candy bar out. The reason for the whole reason for the picture. Big promotional campaign, only one problem. The candy bar had a problem in the formula, in the candy bar, and it melted in the, in the stores. I had to withdraw the candy bar. Here the picture's out, no candy bar, fade out. There's no Wonka candy bar that's famous, but the movie became famous. I was unable to find any clear evidence of any Wonka candy being recalled at the time of the film's release, but I don't think Wolper is lying either. Seeing as there is very little info or promotional material regarding Sunmark's Scrum Diddly Umptious Bar, it could be possible this was the candy bar that David Wolper said was recalled. But if that's the case, no official record of this was ever written in Menlo Smith's biography, or anywhere else from what I've seen. There wouldn't be an officially named Wonka Bar until about 1975, and even then it didn't really resemble the ones from the movie. Rather than chocolate, it was more of an artificially flavored taffy, similar to that of a Tootsie Roll. Rumors aside, the candy was ready, just as Quaker Oats had wanted. But behind the scenes of the movie, everything was not going quite as smoothly as they'd hoped. There are plenty of great sources online which already go into the finer details of the film's production. I'll just go through a few of the most important points. Roald Dahl would have a very firm vision on what would make a faithful adaptation of his book. As part of the agreement, Dahl demanded that only he could write the screenplay, often clashing with the film's director, Mel Stewart, over many crucial aspects of the movie. 
arguably the most important, being who would play Wonka. Dahl wanted Peter Sellers, but when Stewart selected Gene Wilder, Dahl nearly boycotted the entire movie in retaliation. Most infamously was the controversy surrounding the Oompa Loompas, which in the first prints of the book are described as quote-unquote pygmies imported from Africa. Whoa. The visual of small, dark-skinned people wearing nothing but leaves and animal pelts working at a factory in exchange for cocoa beans wasn't exactly a good look for the film, or anybody involved for that matter. To amend this, the Oompa Loompas would be given a more vague, whimsical appearance. Apparently, these changes would also greatly upset Raul Dahl, who at this point had completely disowned the film and refused to work on it any further. In the same vein, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People had another complaint about the title of Dahl's book and the name of its protagonist, Charlie. Charlie at the time was a slang name used for someone who owned slaves, which, going by the implications of the character eventually coming to own a factory full of quote-unquote pygmies imported from Africa, the connection isn't exactly far-fetched. They demanded the title of the movie be changed, so rather than Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the film would instead be called Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. According to Mel Stewart, this may have ultimately been a favorable decision in terms of brand recognition. Since Raul Dahl left the production, David Seltzer would be brought in to rewrite Dahl's half-baked screenplay. Despite Seltzer being responsible for some of the film's most iconic scenes and plot devices which deviated from the novel, he would go uncredited, as Dahl would still be listed as writing the film's screenplay. Apart from a few rough patches, after just a year of development, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory released on June 30th, 1971. With all the money Quaker Oats had poured into their candy-coated house of cards, Paramount Pictures were expecting quite the turnout. And after all, why shouldn't they? Just as Quaker Oats planned, they had created not just a film, but a brand unto itself that would go on to be worth an estimated half a billion dollars. Sadly for Quaker Oats, they wouldn't be getting that money. They'd be getting this money. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory was not particularly well received when it first came out, only netting about four million dollars from its three million dollar budget. It's been said that Wonka was overshadowed by a couple very successful 1971 films, which would go on to become modern classics in and of themselves. The Wonka candy Sunmark produced sold an average amount, but an adequate line of candy and a few mail-in DIY candy kits didn't generate nearly enough to cover how much Quaker had invested into the whole ordeal. Their candy riverboat had sprung a leak and after a couple years of steady decline, they were knee-deep in chocolatey financial despair. Quaker Oats would shyly approach VP of Sunmark, Jerry Zhang, wherein Quaker would propose a desperate deal. Quaker would sell the rights to Wonka for a sum so negligible, neither Menlo or Mr. Zhang could recall what it is today. So long as Sunmark also bought all the leftover inventory, the Wonka candy brand was theirs to do with as they pleased. The film rights and Quaker's 50% stake in revenue would be sold to Warner Brothers for a modest $500,000. After acquiring full rights to the Willy Wonka name in association to candy products, there really wasn't any reason why Sunmark shouldn't flaunt it. From then on, all of Menlo's candy inventions would wear the Wonka name many of which having been born from that simple frazzola powder he packaged as a child. Speaking of which, this fortuitous career wasn't simply inherited to Menlo, it was his drive to innovate on his family's work that kept Sunmark in the spotlight. After his father passed the frazzola company over to him about a decade prior, Menlo needed to find new and cost-effective methods to stand out in the 1960s candy landscape. The natural evolution of Lickamade was Pixie Sticks, an idea conceptualized by Menlo. They were compact, easier to produce, easier to ship, and best of all, wildly popular with kids. But both Lickamade and Pixie Sticks had a similar problem. 
in the hands of messy children, they made too much of a mess. Parents did not like this. It just so happened that Menlo was neighbors with Bob Etter, who just happened to be vice president of manufacturing at the Lewis Howe Company, who just happened to produce Tums. Every day ends with, a Tums festival. with his messy problem in mind, Menlo wanted to see what would happen if they pumped Lickamade powder through the Tums line, and Mr. Etter humored him. Menlo wasn't sure where his future was heading before now. If his father hadn't thrust this job onto him, Menlo would have studied law, maybe become a lawyer, and lead a modest, unassuming life. But somewhere along the way, due to a series of serendipitous events and business-savvy ingenuity, Menlo Smith became the real-life Willy Wonka. The future of Sunmark was looking remarkably sunny. Attaching Wonka onto their pre-existing products was an overwhelming success. The chocolate-based candies commissioned by Quaker Oats had their fans, but shortly after being acquired by Sunmark, they were all discontinued due to lack of sales. By 1974, Sunmark had an estimated $34.5 million increase in sales, and it would only grow further from there. Picking up where Quaker Oats left off, Sunmark used the Wonka name in a variety of tie-in television programs, commercials, and sweepstakes. This marketing would start off fairly inoffensive, but not unlike Willy Wonka's own golden ticket contest it would be a mere prelude to something far more sinister to come. While the Willy Wonka film was unappreciated on its initial release, a whole new form of media technology had found its way into the homes of people all across the globe. Somewhere between 10 to 25% of the U.S. population owned a VCR by the end of 1985, and home releases of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory had found an audience. A cult following at first, which by 1996 had become a full-fledged fan base, touting the movie as a classic comparable to The Wizard of Oz. In a comically ironic twist of fate, there would be a theatrical re-release of the film for its 25th anniversary, where it would net Warner Brothers a hands-free $21 million. A sum that was probably closer to what Quaker Oats was expecting back in 1971. In 2014, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory would be preserved by the Library of Congress as a historically significant piece of media for future generations to admire. All thanks to Quaker Oats. The trailblazing marketing juggernaut that they created rewarded everyone but them. Then in 2001, they were bought by Pepsi. Pepsi On the candy side of things, Sunmark was pumping out more new candy than ever. Runts, Gobstoppers, Spree, and Nerds were among the new long-standing Wonka products to greet the market. By this point in the timeline, it sounds as if things have only just gotten started for Wonka. But it was around this time that Menlo Smith would receive a phone call. In the summer of 1982, Menlo would be getting on a plane. He wouldn't return for four years. When he did, he would sell Sunmark and the Wonka brand to Rowan Tree Macintosh Confectionery. Just a year later, Rowan Tree Macintosh Confectionery would be acquired by Nestle.
When you picture the colorful and imaginative setting of Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, the last thing on your mind is probably the Nestle Corporation, a company that's been synonymous with unethical and unsympathetic business practices since the 1970s. In 2005, former chairman and CEO of Nestle, Brabeck Letmath, would be quoted saying, all of the Earth's drinkable water should have a market value. Eine Anschauung extrem würde ich sagen, wird von einigen von den äh, NGOs vertreten, äh, die darauf buchen, dass Wasser zu einem äh, öffentlichen Recht erklärt wird. Das heißt, als Mensch sollten sie einfach Recht haben, um Wasser zu haben. Das ist die eine Extreme. Ja? Und äh, die andere, die sagt, Wasser ist... Lebensmittel, so wie jedes andere Lebensmittel, sollte das einen Marktwert haben. Ich persönlich glaube, es ist besser, man gibt einem Lebensmittel einen Wert, so dass wir alle bewusst sind. Coming from a company that owns 50 brands of bottled water, producing thousands of bottles a minute, sounds more than a little biased. Although, come to think of it, the 1971 film portrays Willy Wonka as an unsympathetic and jaded business owner, practically inviting children to leap headfirst into dangerous heavy equipment. In Raul Dahl's own original vision, Oompa Loompas are refugees from a foreign country, left with no better option than to perform physical labor and undergo dangerous tests for little to no monetary gain. Maybe it was fate that Nestle came to own the chocolate factory. And perhaps it was fate that the Wonka name would eventually be used for more than marketing just candy. Marge has a point. Sugar is not only fattening, it's also terribly, terribly addictive. Uh, is my carton of pixie sticks in? No, it hasn't come in yet. Damn it! The 90s would bring significant growth to the Wonka brand and its ever-growing family of products, and for good reason. Judging by the way the Wonka film has persisted 20 years past its initial release, and remains a highly profitable media property, Warner Brothers were planning on making a second film adaptation. It was going to make them so much money. Their only problem was Raw Dahl. Ever since the release of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, which he remained openly disgusted with for the rest of his life, Dahl had been extremely protective of his stories, only allowing a few projects to pass under certain circumstances. In 1990, Jim Henson would produce a film adaptation for Roald Dahl's The Witches, starring Angelica Houston as the Grand High Witch. According to IMDb, Dahl was a pretty big fan of this casting choice. But upon seeing a test screening, he was, quote, appalled at the vulgarity, the bad taste, and actual terror in certain parts of the film. Not to mention the ending of the film deviated from the plot of the book, which, much like the rewrites with Willy Wonka, infuriated Dahl. Turn off! He was so upset, in fact, Dahl demanded the producers remove any association of his story from the film, as well as any mention of his name. A very polite letter from Jim Henson would eventually cool Dahl down. This is Kermit the Frog. Now today I'm going to talk to you about being happy. However, the witches made one thing clear to Dahl. He would never again let Hollywood buy his stories for as long as he lived. Luckily for Warner Brothers, later that year, Raoul Dahl died. When eventually... You do finally have to give up or want to give up, whichever comes first. Mm. Um, when, when, when I die. When you die? Yeah. Is there any particular way in which you want to have been remembered? Uh, well, I, I, you can quote Oscar Wilde and say, when I am gone, I hope it will be said, my sins were scarlet, but my books were red. So it would happen a couple Warner Brothers executives would casually approach the Dahl estate just a year later to discuss their idea for a new Willy Wonka movie. Purely coincidental, I'm sure. 
Rald's wife, Felicity Dahl, was weary of her late husband's contempt over the first Wonka film, as well as his vow against all future movie adaptations featuring his stories. But of course, Warner Brothers had anticipated this. They'd agree to give Felicity and her daughter total artistic control over this new film, such as having their own personal choice of deciding basically every person who would work on and appear in the film, including that of the titular role of Willy Wonka. The potential candidates to play Wonka would include the likes of John Cleese, Brad Pitt, Patrick Stewart, Bill Murray, Michael Keaton, Will Smith, Jim Carrey, Nicolas Cage, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and Adam Sandler. Don't you ever say that. Stay here. Stay as long as you can. For the love of God, cherish it. Allegedly, it would be this creative control the Dahl family had over the film that would have it stalled for another decade. Meanwhile, another film based on one of Roald Dahl's classic stories was being made, James and the Giant Peach, produced by none other than Tim Burton. Despite bombing at the box office, Felicity Dahl was fond of the film and of Burton, believing his knack for dark yet family-friendly films complemented Roald's stories perfectly. One thing led to another, and in 2003, Tim Burton was hired to direct the new Wonka movie, and with Burton came Johnny Depp to play Willy Wonka. Tim Burton himself is a big fan of Roald Dahl's stories, and understood the author's dislike of the original film for having strayed from the source material. For those who haven't read the book, the 1971 film prominently features the character of Slugworth, who introduces the everlasting Gobstopper plotline. This comes to a point at the end when, despite Charlie and his grandfather stealing fizzy lifting drinks and being denied their lifetime supply of chocolate, Charlie does the right thing by deciding not to sell the everlasting Gobstopper to Slugworth, thus restoring Willy Wonka's faith that kindness still exists in a selfish world. These scenes were not written by Roald Dahl, but David Seltzer. Slugworth, fizzy lifting drinks, and everlasting Gobstoppers are only mentioned by name in the novel, and have no bearing on the plot. At the end of Roald Dahl's version of the story, Charlie just sort of happens to be the last kid standing by the end of the tour and is immediately rewarded with the factory. The only other major difference between the film and the book were the giant chocolate egg-laying geese. The book instead has trained squirrels who are adept at cracking nuts. Burton wanted his rendition of the film to be more faithful to the book, and in most ways it is. Unlike the 1971 film, Charlie has a dad who works at a factory screwing on toothpaste lids, as described in the book. The Candy River Boat appears to be made out of candy, as described in the book. The giant geese have been replaced with the trained squirrels, as described in the book. All the Oompa Loompa song lyrics, unlike the 1971 film, were lifted much more faithfully from the book. Even the Oompa Loompa's tropical origins are shown in great detail. But of course, at the factory, they all wear tasteful jumpsuits. The Dahl family was pleased with Burton's direction, and so the movie was well underway. There's not too much to say about the production of this film. All of the Oompa Loompas were played by the same actor, Deep Roy. Despite using a generous amount of CG, a great deal of effort went into practical effects. Most notably for the trained squirrels, they literally trained actual squirrels to sit on a stool and strip open nuts. Of course, CG and animatronics were used as well, but the fact that they made the effort for just a few brief shots is admirable. According to Wikipedia, a $540,000 camera was destroyed when it accidentally fell into the Chocolate River. Not sure about the source on that, but I enjoy the notion of a film-grade camera being dipped in chocolate. During production, Warner Brothers were making arrangements of their own. They made the obvious and practical decision of partnering with Nestle to make some of that sweet, sweet tie-in revenue, creating a variety of new and appropriately inventive candies to bolster the Wonka catalog in time for the film. This part of the video was going to be a long, detailed breakdown of the Wonka candy product timeline, but as it turns out, that would have doubled the length of this video. Besides, there is only one product on this timeline that really matters, and that's the Sweet Tarts Squeeze. Nestle reached the pinnacle of candy innovation in 2008, 
and they stopped making it just after a few years, committing yet another egregious crime against humanity. What happens to piled high pepperoni, Nestle? You unlike Quaker Oats, by the early 2000s, Nestle was in the unique position of already having a successful line of products under the Wonka name, but there was something they were missing out on, the very namesake of the film they were trying to capitalize on. In 1999, Nestle created their very own Wonka bar, a chocolate very similar to their Crunch bar, but with graham cracker pieces instead of crisped rice. Nestle would mimic Wonka's golden ticket contest in a variety of their candies, with a unique selection of grand prizes, some of which sounding far better than others. Apart from the candy, there was a Broadway theater musical which would begin showing in late 2004, as well as a video game released the same day as the film for every major platform. It wasn't especially good on any of them. Interest in the new film would also rekindle interest in the original novel, which would rise to the New York Times bestseller list prior to the premiere. With all that said, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory premiered on July 10th, 2005, with a budget of $150 million. Adjusted for inflation, the first film's equivalent $23 million budget is dwarfed in comparison. The new film would go on to gross a worldwide box office total of nearly $475 million, making it the 8th highest grossing film of 2005, and as of today, remains Tim Burton's second highest grossing film. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was a massive success. The movie was very well received by critics upon release, being praised for its visual style, Danny Elfman's soundtrack, and for being more faithful to the novel. Johnny Depp's performance as Wonka was also given high regard at first, but public opinion turned fairly quickly, and the general consensus on its take on Wonka became very mixed. Objection, Your Honor. Hearsay. Many people comparing his acting to be similar to that of Michael Jackson, who, coincidentally, prior to filming, desperately wanted to play the role of Tim Burton's Wonka. Johnny Depp has stated multiple times he took no inspiration from Michael Jackson when performing as Wonka. As the 2005 film aged, opinions as a whole would become divisive, as fans of the 1971 film felt it didn't quite match the special charm of the original. Although, that was likely Tim Burton's goal to create a faithful adaptation to Roald Dahl's novel in his own artistic vision, rather than repeating the old movie step by step. One of Burton's most notable critics on his take on Wonka was none other than Gene Wilder, who considered the film to be an insulting cash grab. Are you bothered by remakes of classic films of yours like Willy Wonka, Charlie, and the Chocolate Factory? Uh, I think it's an insult, and it's probably Warner Brothers insult, I think. I like Warner Brothers for other reasons, but to do that with Johnny Depp, who, who I think is a good actor, and I like him, but I don't care for that director, and he's a talented man, but I don't care for him for doing stuff like he did. I bought a DVD copy of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory from a guy at Rossi's, and without exaggeration, he said something like, I did not like that movie. Johnny Depp was weird, and the Oompa Loompas were all the same man. Okay. Regardless of if you prefer the 1971 or 2005 films, there's no denying which one made the most money. But on the other hand, when you look at the way Wonka is marketed, especially today, it's pretty clear which iteration has endured the longest. Of course, what people thought of the new film in retrospect didn't really matter to Warner Brothers or Nestle. They had a hit, and in that short 2004-2005 to time frame, the Wonka name was more popular than it ever was. But in this perfect window of time, Nestle had a problem. A very familiar problem. The Wonka chocolate that they've been producing this whole time wasn't making enough money. <laughs> Oh my god! In yet another strange twist of fate, 
Wonka chocolate, as produced by Nestle, had uneasy sales. One of Nestle's own CEOs has been quoted in regards to their chocolate, saying, Wonka is a brand that comes and goes. Which is a safe corporate way of saying Wonka chocolate sells well initially because of its novelty aspect, but would consequently plummet in sales far more quickly than their usual lineup. And this problem would only worsen as Nestle's entire confectionery business would decline in the 2010s. There were three distinct iterations of Nestle Wonka bars which came and went, with a few other miscellaneous chocolate-based Wonka candies that failed so badly they aren't exactly relevant. I have already mentioned their first Wonka bar, available from 1999 to 2010, the most successful by virtue of existing in the radius of the 2005 film. Next came the Wonka Exceptionals line, which was an attempt to market the chocolate to a more mature audience. This attempt was ultimately a loss, as Exceptionals was discontinued just two years later in 2012. However, there was reportedly a large following who enjoyed these so much that upon hearing of their cancellation, people impulsively bought all the remaining stock. This was apparently encouraged by Nestle on social media. Then came the new Wonka bar line exclusive to Europe, released sometime just after Exceptionals were cancelled. According to Nestle, this line was also an attempt to market to a more mature audience, but much like the Exceptionals, two years later, they were all gone. 2014 would be the last the world would see of the Wonka bar. At least those sold by Nestle, because as recently as 2022, Unofficially produced Wonka bars would be seized from European stores after police discovered several unchecked health hazards in the chocolate, most notably, unlisted allergens. Are you okay? Yeah. There is a very fascinating New York Times article from 2017 that explains how the popular Wonka Broadway musical had people asking the concession stands for Wonka bars, which Nestle were no longer producing. The theater would later resort to wrapping Hershey bars in gold foil and purple wrappers. In regards to the Wonka brand, a Nestle spokesperson told the New York Times, We're considering a variety of options, but for now, our innovation plans remain confidential. What a load of bullshit. With a property so closely associated with chocolate, it's bizarre that there hasn't been a single chocolate product, not just from Nestle, but throughout the entire history of the Wonka brand, with any significant staying power. When Wonka chocolate was available, it faded into the background. When it was gone, people would clamor for its return. No matter the case, it's clear whatever power the Wonka badge held did little to sell non-fictional chocolate. In 2018, it was announced that Nestle would be selling a majority of their confectionery products to Ferrero, including everything under the Wonka brand. This decision likely wasn't caused solely due to Wonka's unstable sales, but it most certainly contributed to Nestle's growing desire to dip out of the candy market. Nestle still stands today as one of the world's most influential food giants. And yet, when they took hold of one of the world's most influential names in modern fiction, they may have bitten off more than they could chew. Right around this time, you may have noticed a very slight change, not only in Nestle's own flagship candies. Sweet Tarts, Nerds, Lickamade? Most of the classic Wonka candy is still available today, with one small but very important detail removed. Where is Wonka? Ferrero acquired the Wonka trademark and all their associated products, so why make the decision to scrub the Wonka name? Was this part of the agreement with Nestle? As far as I've researched, the exact reason for this change is still not known. The disappearance of Wonka at the time of writing this is something of a mystery held behind locked doors of giant corporate headquarters. But with Warner Brothers in the process of creating yet another Wonka film adaptation, that familiar emblem is sure to reemerge very, very soon. 
Speaking of Warner Brothers, WB has always had something of a penchant for squeezing every ounce of profit from their intellectual properties, no matter how ethically questionable it may be. This would explain why Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, a film about the dangers of greed and selfishness, is actively being used to promote gambling. After all, what is Wonka's Golden Ticket Contest if not a lottery? It's the perfect premise. Why even bother engineering candy to sell your property when the very notion of your property is now capable of selling itself ten times over? A poor child, down on his luck, gets one golden chance to make his way in the world. All it costs him is the price of a candy bar. Again, and again, and again. Perhaps this was Roald Dahl's fear all along. The fear that decades after his death, multi-billion dollar companies would continue to twist his ideas beyond recognition for the sake of profit. Taking all this into account, his resentment towards those who changed his story into a global media phenomenon sounds justified in retrospect. There is one silver lining in this bleak dystopian story from somebody you may have forgotten about by now. Remember in 1982 when Menlo Smith went away somewhere for four years? Maybe you thought he had retired or had gone on a very long vacation. The truth is, he was really on a mission. A mission from his friend, Jesus Christ. Or more specifically, the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, of which Menlo was a devout follower. He would spend four years living in the Philippines. In his time there, he bore witness to hopeless suffering and poverty at the hands of a broken and unfair economy. This was his turning point. The crux of what made Menlo Smith quit being a candy man. With the help of his colleagues, Menlo would gather money to develop a microcredit loan system which went on to assist millions of people in the Philippines and other developing countries start independent businesses and generate their own wealth. The idea to help people in countries like the Philippines come out of poverty started back in the early 80s. I had seen poverty before but didn't realize the depth of the poverty. The most important thing we do is to build character to help people get to the point where they have the discipline, the principles, and the motivation to do the things they need to do to be self-supporting. As of writing this, Menlo Smith, veteran, father of five, man of God, is 95 years old. He has lived through, became, and surpassed the entire Wonka legacy from beginning to present. And it all began with a one-cent pouch of imitation Kool-Aid. So what I've gathered is that Frazola became popular because of World War II, which means that sweet tarts happened because of hip- 